job in city. The forest is fragmented by 89, and it's in very, very small patches. And so I feel pretty confident that we don't have a lot of bears around. So I do keep my feeders out um, year round. But some of us have to take them in. So it kind of becomes, what's the next step? What else can I do? And I try to push a lot of people into the realm of gardening. And there's a number of really great reasons to do that. Like part of it is that you get this connection again with the birds, but there's this other part that's a really good thing to think about. This is my only doom and gloom slide for the whole entire show, so this will be brief. But consider this. So this is from the 2016 Audubon State of the Birds Report. So in an analysis of all 1,154 species of birds in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico identified, they, they identified 432 species that meet the criteria for the Audubon watch list. And so we're looking at a higher and higher number of birds being listed on, in this space um, each year. And part of it is the degradation of habitat. It's the fragmentation of the habitat. It's conversion of habitat. And one of the things that we can do is we can be better stewards of the habitat that we're in and the footprint that we create. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to turn passion into action, and we're going to combine the top two hobbies in the United States into this really good thing for birds. So we're going to talk a little bit about preserving native plants. And I have been thinking, like my, my thinking process and how to provide the best backyard habitat for birds has really changed um, over the over probably the past 10 years. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about changing the garden aesthetic. Um, and being a caretaker of wildlife. How many of you have gardens at home, whether vegetable or flower? Okay. How many of you are landowners that own larger tracts of land? Okay, acres? Okay, good. So I'm not going to talk so much about larger tracts of land today, but you're going to see hints of that here and there in what we are going to discuss. All right, so let's start from the foundation. We're going to build some basic elements here for birds. So these basically are covering the four needs that birds have, which is food, cover, nesting, and water. If we can find a way to incorporate these four elements into our backyard, we're going to be inviting a larger diversity of species in. All right, here we go. Quiz time. Who's that? Goldfinch. Yep, American goldfinch. How about this one? American Robin, Yellow Warbler, Northern Cardinal, nice job, all right. So one of the ways that we can do this is really by getting and like assessing what we've got going on already in our yard. And this is a very nice drawing. Mine for my yard is really super messy, but it gives me a place to just start. So we can map out where our house is, um, this person put in uh, dotted lines about where, like, this is the yard that we use. This is our half acre yard. And then thought about outside of that area, what can we do in order to kind of make that less yard-like, less lawn, and um, we can let that go. But you're going to see inside here, they also laid out some of the other things that are important to them. Their deck is here. They've got a gazebo. There's the play area for kids. Man, I know that in my house there's like the trampoline is there and the play structure is there. Um, and then the vegetable garden, right, is, is here. So we could start to put all of those on the map and then think about how do we create less lawn? How can we decrease the amount of lawn we have and have more wildlife? I mean, you've all driven by the houses that are like up back on the property and then everything is mowed. And I was like, that's going to take you days to do. That's like days of burning that you could have in your back pocket rather than mowing. Or whatever you like to do, whether it's golf or whether it's, I don't know, um, playing cards. I don't think I play, oh my gosh, frisbee disc golf now, all of those things. More wildlife, less lawn, more time for yourself. Naps. I'm like, yeah, that would be nice rather than mowing the lawn. We can also start to look at how we can preserve and protect the native plants. So let's see, within the yard space, right, starting to identify 
Uh, let's see, we'll take D, is silky dogwood. So this is where they have dogwood. So let's make sure that we keep that there and maybe look at other places where we can put that on the property. There's white birch, right? So all these letter Bs are white birch. Maybe too we can work out where, or here's the apple tree. Maybe we make sure that this apple tree stays with enough space from the cedars and the other tree next to it so it can continue to grow into fruit. So we want to identify where our native plants are on the property. And we also want to start to create later layers. You've probably noticed this today, right? For those of you who are out with me slow birding this morning, we were watching where the different birds were within the spots where we were sitting. The ravens were way up high on the ridge line, and down in the garden down low were the sparrows. So we want to be able to kind of mimic that and maybe create some different layers um, in our yards as well. All right. Then there's the fun stuff too, like those really nice magnets that can pull the birds in. So water can be a challenging feature. I'm really fortunate in my yard, we have um, a very small quarter acre lot in um, St. Albany City, but right out the back of where our play space is, is all forest from all the other landowners that are on the street that's perpendicular to our street. And there's a brook that runs through that forest. So we get that nice water sound, and it's a very wonderful attractant for birds. We've had great blue heron in there. I can't, I'm like, where did that bird come from? We had a belted kingfisher like cruise up the brook the other day, and I hadn't had that one on the list before. But if you don't have a natural water feature, you can create it. One of the coolest things I have ever seen um, on Hog Island um, in Maine, they built a, a bubbling fountain, much like this, where there, were, there was a pool where the water came out and then dropped in. And what was wonderful is you could sit on the deck with a cup of coffee and sit and watch the water fountain. And because that water sound was being made with the bubbler, the, the warblers came in to rest and to bathe and to, to hang out. And I mean, this is awesome. Who's this? American Red Star, right? Canada warbler? No. You gotta work hard to see one of those birds. They're normally deep within the thickets, but they need water, they need to bathe. I don't even know who this is. Who's this? Yes? Goldfish, maybe? Mm, I, yeah, I don't know. Somebody different. Um, full on bathing. And maybe, right, the other thing that we can put in is a bird bath as well. One of the things I tell people with bird baths is make sure you put some rocks or something in here, especially if it's a glazed bird bath. Like, be the bird. Come in for a landing. Think about you're slipping on that glaze right into the water. Put some pebbles and cobbles in the bottom. Put one stone that stays up a little bit so the birds have a spot to kind of perch and drop in as they like. And There's and also stubbler. Solar fountains, you put them in the bird bath and they, when the sun gets on them, they, they spray. spray. So there are new little devices that you can float in the middle of your bird bath that then will create that fountain effect to create that bubbling sound for them. So, yeah. What's a good depth of the water to have in the bath? Not many inches. I would say like two inches, probably not more than that. And you also have to wash it out, right? Because you get mosquitoes in there or it gets kind of gunky with algae. So, or your dog drinks out of it. And then you're like, all right, we got to start over. But I think about two inches is really good. And put, I mean, even if you just put one stone in the middle, um, it'd be good. There are also heated options in winter. Anybody messed around with that? I haven't tried that yet. Yeah? I enjoy that, but I love it. Okay, good. I would I really love to try that. You've got to make sure you don't let it go empty. Okay. Because if you do, it could burn out the heater, but also it can blow the circuit break. It can burn out the And then you put more water in, and it freezes. Yeah. So you know. And then you got to go find the circuit break. Well, the best yeah. ha habitat um, in my yard is the brush we're going to talk about so brush piles. Yes. And that, look at that. Yeah, Perfect segue. It's the very next slide. So this is part of like changing the garden aesthetic, which is what I love about being able to walk around here. We can take a lot of cues from nature to figure out how to mimic that same kind of look in our yard. If we think about how many of you went out to the garden today, or at least walked by it on the way to the banding station, Right? Is it like perfectly weeded and it's 
all, you know, like, mm -hmm. no, it's messy. It's got a lot of stuff going on. There's dead headed, there's, the dead heads have been left on, so they're full of seeds. So really what we have to start to do is start changing our perception of what is beautiful on the landscape and thinking more about how can we provide a little bit of a variety of different um, features for birds to be able to feed on. I will never forget the first time um, I was a homeowner and um, we had this beautiful picture window and the edge of the property like fell off in front and it was awesome and I built this giant brush pile. <laughs> we should view. And my mom came over and we're hanging out and she was like, why do you have to have that brush pile there? It's just so messy looking. And I was like, get your cup of coffee and come and sit with me and you're gonna see in a minute what it's like there. And the sparrows were bopping in and out of there. Um, she's converted now. She, she's like, I believe in brush piles. So brush piles, you can make them super fancy with like larger logs and things on the bottom so things like rabbits and squirrels and chipmunks can get in there and get cover so you're providing cover for other wildlife. Or you can just toss it up there. I've got a couple in my backyard now, um, including all the Christmas trees from my neighbors because we gather those in the winter time to build cover for birds around our feeder. Um, that now the jewel weed is coming up through. And it's just, it's kind of beautiful. So there's a soft green edge along with the brush. Yeah, our brush pile kind of becomes a green mound yes. during the summer. There's different vines and stuff that grow up. Hang on, that maybe you get some Virginia creeper on there or right. some wild grape. It's, all, it's covered in Virginia creeper. And that's got berries, which Very is pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So, birds. Bridget, do you leave it forever? Like, ongoing or is there some maintenance to I, there's not our time taking it down and building something if we want to have a fire that's where i go to grab <laughs> stuff and we're going to have a little fire together a couple christmas trees yeah. but otherwise so it can be like a storage unit. it's just there yep and it's on the back border of our property and the chip yeah and i have that's where all my sparrows are as the sparrows start to come in and the white crown sparrows move through that's where I'm going to hang out and focus my attention, especially in my sit spot in my backyard. We talked about this with slow burning. I have a spot that I like to go to in my yard every day for about 20 minutes where I look and watch and take notes about what I'm seeing and what I'm noticing. And so I know that's, that's the sparrow spot. That's where I want to look. I want to get my sparrows. That will slowly rot from the bottom, so you can just keep adding stuff yeah. to it. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. 30 years. Yeah, every, 30, time, every, time, every time there's a windstorm, I just go around the yard and gather There we go, yeah. On the other hand, if you have made a burner pile, yes. and you, uh, there's so much life in it, when is it the safest, safest time to actually burn? Winter. Winter. So it's like, it's like but then, but then, to stick season. Right? We're getting into this now. They're going to move think, through. The other thing, too, is if you to think things are burrowing in there. Mm -hmm. Little they could. Yeah. I think as you pull things off, too, it'll it'll disrupt and move them. Build another one. It'll be like, <laughs> moving over here. This is your next spot to go. Okay. Yeah. So you tell stick them season or winter? I would say stick season is probably pretty good. Um, because then winter time, right, there may be birds taking shelter in that at night to stay warm. And may, there may be like multiples in there to stay warm at night. So, yeah. All right. Remember I was talking about layers? Here's another way to think about why we want to add layers to our property. So birds sit in different niches, right? They all have their little place where they like to be where it fits, so they're not totally over or out competing each other. So the more different types of layers that we can have um, in our yard, where we're softening some of those hard edges that especially the predators like to move along. I think of foxes and I think of cowbirds or um, skunks that are nest predators. Um, that hard edge is a really nice pathway for them. If we soften that edge, they gotta go out and around. They may become um, objects of prey, like the cooper stock in my yard. Um, so we soften those edges, we add layers, and there are different birds that are in each of those different types of layers. So our diversity is going to go up as we add more layers in our backyard. So it's another way, when you get that map done, is to look and be like, ooh, I could add something there. So there's that big white pine, and there's the corner of the yard. I'm going to add some kind of mounding shrub and then drop down into perennials down here. 
Yeah, we put a witch hazel bush in one of the back corners. Yeah, and that's it gives a little corner of habitat right it's there. A spot for them to go into, right? All right, so we're going to talk a little bit um, now about preserving native plants and really knowing natives for your region. Um, finding native stock, and this can be really challenging, I think. Um, removing invasive plants um, and alternatives to invasives. So here we have um, cedar waxwing on a juniper. Juniper is one of the top 10 plants for wildlife because they provide like a multiple, a, a whole set of those different elements. So it's food, nesting, and cover, especially during winter time. Anybody know the bird and the plant in this one? Yes. Who's this? Rose Spencer Rose. Yeah, look at this. There's just a little yeah. bit of that rose wash coming in here. And the plant? Elderberry. Yeah, it, it's cl yeah, that's close. That's close. Mountain ash. Mountain ash. Mountain ash. Yeah. Mountain ash. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mountain. My sadly, my neighbor had to take down his mountain ash in his yard, and I'm already. I'm like, so Peter, what are you gonna put in instead? Okay. You're gonna put another mountain ash in there? How about a crab apple? What do you think? Because that's the spot where all the pine grosbeaks beaks hang out in the winter time in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So here's the other thing to really think about as you start to pick native plants, is these guys. All the caterpillars that are going to munch on your native plants. And instead of getting bummed out about that, get really excited about that. Because the main source of food, especially during the breeding season and the mating season for birds is our caterpillars. They really prefer insects, but the number one choice is gonna be a caterpillar. They're really high in protein, they're high in carotenoids, um, and they're, they're, just, they're gonna be great to be able to feed their young as the young are starting to fledge. Including tent caterpillars? Including tent caterpillars, yes. And it's funny, I knew someone was gonna ask that today. So I did my homework. So what's really great, especially um, the fall webworm that we're seeing right now, so that, so Cold Holiday Canada, which is a forest conservation nonprofit, if you go to their website, 2017, Nancy Patch, you can find a really great article that she wrote about the life cycle of tent caterpillars and how one of them is native. It's part of the natural cycle here. And there's a whole set of birds that go along with that. The cuckoos that Bill was playing the, the calls for, both the black-billed and yellow-billed cuckoos will eat those tent caterpillars. They're really good at smashing them and tenderizing them too. So if you can watch them, you could be like, yes, take out all your aggression on that type of caterpillar. So, um, so think about, I want you to think more about caterpillars. So here's what's really cool. This is the white blotched heterocampa. Um, and um, this one changes into this. So it's a type of moth and this is from here on site, I pulled this off of iNaturalist, Judy Wellman documented this moth, and so we have this caterpillar somewhere out there mm -hmm. chewing on, I don't know, anybody got a guess of what that is? I know what it is. How it's, big oh, is yeah. Do, how big is it? Like, yeah, like that. And how big is the moth? The mo I'm not sure how big the moth is. I don't think it's very large. I don't think it's much larger than like that down to that first knuckle on your thumb. It's not a very big moth. What was the plant? Um, oak. It's a, it's some species of oak. Mm -hmm. I have a question about caterpillars. Um, yeah. What about the monarchs? What about monarchs? So yeah. So I have them everywhere. So I'm just wondering. Monarch caterpillars are tasty too, and birds are definitely yeah. gonna. I don't want to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> I know mean, you're like, don't eat those. And they do have some of those like warning stripes that some birds are not gonna be into eating those. Um, but yeah, they're they're our food source. Yeah, yep. the uh, monarchs eat milkweeds. And they take up that uh, horrible taste. Yep. And that's oh, yeah, their defense. The and that's their defense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it lasts throughout all that, too. Yeah. And there's probably a species or two of bird that's like, yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. That's fine with me. So here's why it really matters. If you think back to science, maybe you took a biology class in, um, or ecology class in college, is when we start to think about trophic levels and some of the things that birds need in order to survive. If caterpillars are one of the big, hardcore 
pieces of their diet that they are going to need in order to successfully breed and fledge their young. We need a lot of caterpillars on the landscape, right? So if we provide this bottom part of the, the pyramid here, if we do a better job at this, then we're going to have more of this. And we'll have more. This is from a, um, a Royal Society for the Protection of Birds study on blue tits and um, sparrow hawks. And so they found that in neighborhoods that had more native species of plants that were preferred by more native caterpillars, that the blue ticks were more successful breeding. And then you had a stronger population of sparrow hawks as well. All right, but there's this other really great paper um, that just came out last year. And I've connected with um, Desiree Durango online. What's really interesting is there's a very robust um, community of PhD candidates um, and PhD um, scientists who are very active on Twitter in the bird world. So that's how I met her, was on Twitter. And so she was posting all this great stuff about improving natives and um, in the garden setting and how it affects um, different bird species. So she actually did this study um, with uh, Carolina chickadees, looking at non-native plants and how they reduce populations of an insectivorous bird. And the really cool way that she did this is she did a nest watch program. So in DC, she was working with the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center um, as well at the time. What they did is they approached landowners who would be willing to put up a nest box in the backyard. They used PVC piping. This was one that the landowner um, already had. Landowners who didn't have nest boxes, they built these really cool PVC pipe um, nest boxes that were just about that big. It was a white PVC pipe. Then they put some brown paint streaks on it so it looked like perch. And the birds came and nested in those boxes. Now they put perches up. Normally you don't want to do this, right? Because it encourages um, house sparrows and some other birds that you might not want in, in the box. Um, in preference to maybe your bluebird, or in this case, the chickadees. But what it did is it allowed the bird to pause before it went inside to feed the young. And it gave the scientists an opportunity to either watch the bird or they put game cameras up to snap photos of the bird so that they could then identify the insect species that they were bringing in. So super cool. I was like, okay, this is awesome. The birds were also banded as well. So the scientists would come out, the volunteers would come out. So this is Desiree here with one of her landowners. They would ban all the baby birds that they found. So that she's got a baby bird here in her banding kit. So they would do a color band study where at the map station here, you put on a little bracelet that's got a code on it that then gets written down. But with their study, what they wanted to use the bands for was visual confirmation of an individual bird as they were watching it. So there were color codes. So there was silver on one leg and then yellow on top of blue on another leg. So that was silver, yellow on top of blue. Goes from the bird box to the oak tree. Or goes from the bird box to the willow. And they started tracking that as well to see which different types of plants in the yard that um, each of these birds went to. They also did a yard assessment to see what was there in terms of native versus non-native species. And they found something really pretty cool. So what they found, you can see that right here. So here's number of young, here's all these caterpillars, in a yard that's mostly native plants versus mostly non-native plants. And then they looked at the reproduction success for each of those um, little nest boxes. And so in the yards that had mostly native plants, the reproduction and the fledgling success rate actually was very, very high. Mostly non-native plants was low. So what they found is that with, when most songbirds need all of those insects, and I'm going to say caterpillars, I'm going to be bold and say when all those songbirds need lots of different varieties of caterpillars in order to survive, the yards that had non-native plants, the birds weren't as successful. The fledglings were less robust. Um, and the survival rate was lower. And the great thing is, is they came up with a threshold to be able to give to the public and say, this is where you want to be at. So this, this, the threshold is a 70-30. So yards with more than 70% native plant biomass will succeed <coughs> the chickadee populations. And, if, and so you want to err on the 30% side for your non-natives. 
So that's another thing that we can go back to. We've created that beautiful map of our yard. We've started to get to know what we have where. And now we can start to focus in on boosting the native um, species of plants that we have there. Then you're like, what do I put in? And what do I take out? So that's when we have to start doing a little bit of a deeper dive. And what's even more cool that's come out of this study, and I don't have my, I have my um, box out under my table. I'll have to grab it. So she is studying um, with, I believe his first name is Doug Townley. And he has written a couple of different books on um, improving your backyard. They're, they're within the past, actually he has a new book coming out in February as well. And what he's done is he started to look at species and caterpillar count. So now you can look at high caterpillar count species and be like, that's what I want to have on my property. So here are four. So we have um, American, and I, and I didn't change the uh, size. So this is not American elm. This is now yellow birch and choke cherry, sugar maple, and northern red oak. So yellow birch. 403 species of caterpillar feed on that type of tree. This is one of the trees that we encourage landowners with larger acres, right? If you're talking 50, 100 acres, that we're asking them, think about creating a refuge for yellow birch on your property. Let's keep those on your property because they have a high number of caterpillar. Um, more so than the other birches. More so than the other birches, yes, definitely. So yellow birch is very, very high. Um, Choke cherry um, in the aronia um, species, 456. Where we, one of the things that I, this has shifted for me is like a lot of times we think about birds eating the fruits and the berries and the nuts. And now we have the research that's also starting to show the types of insects that they're preying on and now caterpillar type. So we can really get down to it. Maples, this is sugar maple. Not super high, not as high as those other two, but still in the hundreds, 297. And this last one is um, red oak, which is also a really great species in terms of climate resiliency. So if you have red oak on your property, you want to keep that there. That's one of the species that's gonna be able to kind of withstand um, climate change, especially in the Northeast. So we actually are trying to assist oak in staying here by employing squirrels and blue jays to go out and plant more and more acorns. Actually, they're better at doing it than we are. In Europe, um, they actually find where the blue jays like to hang out and leave oaks that they would like planted, like the acorns, because the blue jays do a better job. There's a higher success rate when an oak, when an acorn is planted by a blue jay than by a person. Are most of the oaks that are in this area northern red oak? No. No, they're white. No, they're white. So, so that we have patches of them. So that's part of like thinking back on when I look at my property, what do I have? What's really super valuable and what can I keep and protect here? Um, Audubon, Vermont, um, and um, oh gosh, Jamie Fidel, somebody help me out. Um, in Montpelier, they have a really great set of um, resources that will help you look at climate resiliency um, uh, across the landscape in terms of forest management. I believe um, Forest Parks and Recreation actually has a whole booklet on that that you can get as a landowner. So yeah. how, how resilient is it out here? Here? Yeah. Um, does so it grow on its own or it do does it bring it in? No, it does grow on its own. It's in pockets, so more more in the southern part of the state. But as, as things change and shift, we are going to see it more in this part, in the northern part of the state. And it's important to, to start that now because yes. it takes so long to mature. Yep, yep. <clears throat> so that's why when you work with a forester especially, so if a forester found a patch of, I mean red oak or any type of oak here on the property, if you were thinking about harvesting it, you could say we're, we're going to leave that alone. We want to leave that alone because we want to keep that in place. So. For perennials, and this is the other challenge, I feel like trees and shrubs are pretty easy because there's plenty of resources out there that will tell us what's good in terms of food cover nesting and now caterpillars as well. 
But I think the challenge comes when we want these beautiful landscaped gardens. And there's a lot more ornamentals out there as well. But we can start to think about what can we put in our garden that gets us that same effect, that same pop of color, but also is bringing the caterpillars. We get goldenrod, 122 different types of caterpillar. And there's multiple types of goldenrod um, as well. When I, when I saw Zach going out today to catch monarchs, I wanted to be like, can you just get me like a bag of caterpillars? Because I just want to see like some of this 122 species of caterpillar that are probably out there on the, on the early goldenrod. Jerusalem artichoke is the next one. I have this one in my backyard. The hummingbirds love it. Um, it's not that tubular shaped um, flower that we always think of that hummingbirds love, but in the center of that, um, in many of the aster species, all of those are little tiny individual flowers. And so they really love um, that Jerusalem artichoke. And then I leave it, I leave it messy, and I let it go to seed, and then the birds are there throughout the winter as well. Do the goldfinches like Gold the seed? Goldfinches like the seed, yep, mm -hmm. they're there as well. So leaving it messy, which also drives my mom crazy. I'm not gonna clean up your gardens yet. I'm like, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna leave it. That's the way it's gonna be. Um, Joe Kyweed is one of my favorites. It's also a really great one um, for pollinators as well. Just that beautiful purple and the deep dark um, uh, branching on it as well. So 30 species there. Anybody know this this one? Yeah. What's that? Primrose. Evening primrose. So common evening primrose. Um, 17 species of caterpillar, and you get the bonus if you leave it. It has that great, so all the flower stalk comes up, and then the pods on here. These kind of, after the flower goes to seed, you still get these weird little trumpet-shaped pods that open up, and the goldfinches and the sparrows, and if you have snow buntings around you, they will come to that as well. So leave that behind, or grab those flower heads from the side of the road when you're driving around and bring them and stick them out in your backyard or shake out the seed as well. It's amazing how much seed in there. But they're a great host for caterpillars too. So the other challenge here when we're starting to look at gardens is what's available out there. And this is where um, the state has started a program called PlantWise where they're recognizing the nurseries that don't carry invasives anymore or are starting to take invasives out of their stock. So things like this first one, anybody know this one? Burning bush. Burning bush, quite gorgeous. You see it everywhere, right? It's like the standard one that gets planted as a foundation planting. A lot of um, non-native species that have berries, people are always like, that has berries, the birds eat it. A lot of those non-native species don't have a really good caloric value to them or fat value or um, carbohydrate value to them. So it passes through the bird really quickly and there's nothing there for it. So in place of that, we could consider something else like you know, that one might be tough. That's blueberry, so high bush blueberry um, is a really good one. So you're still getting that pop of red color that maybe is attracting you to the burning bush. There's lots of other burning, there's lots of other bushes that are on fire in the fall. So we can find one that's native and have some. Okay, so blueberry, 276 caterpillar species. So you might, you might be throwing the net over for the blueberries, but leave it open before the blueberries are ripe so that the birds can get at the caterpillars because there's a lot of great caterpillar species there. Mm -hmm. And over 37 species of birds um, use blueberry bush in one way or another way, whether it's a cover or a nesting. How about the next one? No. Oh yeah, yellow flag iris. Have you ever dug this up and gotten burned by it? So it's got that, like, um, what is it? The, the sun hits the oils and it burns your skin. So you have to be very careful when removing this. So this is a non-native, but we can replace it with Right, the blue flag iris. And there's 14 caterpillar species that like blue flag, flag iris. So that's a good replacement. This is the non-native honeysuckle. honeysuckle. We do have a native honeysuckle that has a more yellow tone flower. So you could try to replace um, that way. I have a whole hedgerow that is shared with my neighbor um, of honeysuckle. The birds love it for cover. That's where they go when the Cooper's hawk comes in. They leave the feeder and they go there. Um, but 
if you think about it, if you could pick something else that was that had like more of the elements that we're looking for, plus caterpillars on top, right? So if, if honeysuckle is just good for cover and the berries are getting pooped out so they don't really have a good nutritional value, maybe we can replace that with something else. Oh my gosh, my favorite one in the whole world. If I ever had a plant crush, it would be on this tree shrub service berry. So shad bush, Emily here. Um, gorgeous white flower early in the spring, so it like makes you think, yes, yeah, spring is actually coming, and then it'll <laughs> snow again, and, and, but it'll go away, and the shadow will let you know. Um, and then it gets this beautiful little orange berry that so many different um, species of birds love, um, about 26, 26 different species of birds. Well, so Bridget, where are these in terms of deer? Attraction. Deer attraction. So yeah. They don't care as long as the deer don't kill them. Kill them, right? Yeah. And so do bluebirds get much time by deer? Not, not so much. Not so much. Anybody know about service berry? Not so much. I know cedars some. get hit really hard. Some, but right. mine are making it. So I'm pretty sure the list that the state has has them sorted that way. So they have different native species that they can recommend, and then there's the um, Vermont invasive. Um, network that can also start to give you ones that, okay, if you're looking for deer um, tolerant species, you'll be able to find those on there as well. All right, a couple more. Mm -hmm. This one, mm -hmm. purple blue stripe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Put Joe Pyweed in instead. <laughs> oh, this. And they like similar, you know, wet feet, right? They like those wet habitats. How about this one? Barberry. Oh my gosh, it's so unpleasant too. Like, I'm like, can you pick a bush that catches all the city's trash, please? <laughs> um, it's also so it's just so not attractive. Yeah, it's also it also attracts mice and it's it's tick and the tick yeah. piece, yeah. right? Yeah. So when we have a landscape that has more non-native species on it, we have more ticks. So for some reason, ticks don't mind. Um, the, the barberry or the honeysuckle, I'm trying to think of the other one, probably that euonymus as well. Um, so you just find, I know at Hardap, where I really love to go because there's shrub scrub birds, this is the ski area up in St. Albans that you can see from Route 89, that lower level is all this beautiful shrub scrub habitat. It's where I go for brown thrashers and toadies. There's golden winged warblers in there too, but I am like, like buttoned up and socks up to my knees and mm -hmm. like sprayed mm -hmm. because there's all kinds of invasives in there, um, in that shrubland as well. Um, Does this have thorns too? Yes, that has thorns too, and that's what collects the trash. So here's a different, um, this is uh, the uh, black choke cherry, so Aronia melanocarpa. So you get that bright red pop, which is really nice. Um, it's not as deep red as the barberry, but then you get these deep blue berries as well. Um, bishop's weed, I have it in my house. Oh my gosh, I just want to beat the bishop's weed. I can't, I keep trying. Um, it'll take a while to suppress it. Um, I keep pulling it out and putting cardboard down over the top of it, I'm sure, after a while. But it's a ground cover, and that's what people find it attractive for. But there are native ground covers that we can go to um, as well that'll just be a little bit better. So this is bearberry. Bearberry? Yeah. Um, just really beautiful. Um, and, and thick, leathery, light leaves. Too. And those leaves, those berries are, are edible. Yep. Partridge. Some part grouse really like those. All right, so really what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide the best bird buffet we can, right? <laughs> so you think of the best potluck that you've ever been to, and that's by organized by someone who is like, you're gonna bring this, and you're gonna bring a salad, and we need a fruit thing, and we need a pasta dish. Like they've done all that work. So it is a little bit of work to get there, but it's gonna pay off, and it will pay off in birds, like the 68 species of birds that I've recorded in my backyard. And it's not just the resident ones, it's the ones that are moving through and taking a break and dropping out of the sky, Bill, right? That are like, oh, I just gotta take a rest before I take off again and maybe get something to eat and move on. So now I told you about the caterpillars for the breeding season. The other part of the buffet is it needs to be seasonal year round, right? 
So we want to try to make sure we're hitting all the different spots of the year for these birds that we love so much. So spring and summer, we can think about, okay, all of those different caterpillar species um, and other insects that they are going to want to eat. But then as we move into late summer and into fall and even into winter, we've got the migratory food choices that we really need to provide for them so that they can make it across the Gulf or make it down to Argentina or wherever they're going to go in Central and South America. And then we need to think about the things that are going to help them get through winter as well. So different ways to group these things. When you're looking at your yard, you can be like, do I have summer fruiting choices in my yard? Things like service berry or blueberry, raspberries, blackberries, elderberry. We were talking, right? We were talking to Annette about the elderberry in the middle of the garden and being like, I'm going to watch that plant because the birds are going to go there. Wild grape, wild cherry. A lot of these are really, really important for our young birds especially so that they get that energy that they need as they're trying to hide and outwit and outlast predators and prey. So it's really about um, kind of giving them high, high carbohydrates in the form of sugar that's going to help them get to that point where they're then ready to migrate and move on. Okay, who's this? Cedar Rock Cedar Scarlet Tenders. Scarlet I gotta tell you, I was at the Merck Forest Center down Ruth's way. Where's Ruth? Yep. Merck, Merck Forest Center, leading a walk with some clients. And we went up to where the blueberry patch was, of course, because, right, it's so awesome to like bird and, and eat at the same time. And we looked down into this little swale, and there were choke cherries. Um, sumac, and I'm trying to think of what else was in there, but it was mostly choke cherries, big choke cherry trees. And these guys had on their list that they wanted to see scarlet tanager and rose-breasted grosbeak. And I was like, oh, wow, how am I going to deliver that? That's going to be so hard. The birds were there. That's where they were. So these deep woods interior species of birds, it's really amazing. When you put these things in, their yard, in your yard, they will come out and come into those places where they can feed. So I did. I got them scarlet tanager, and I got them on a rose-breasted grosbeak. It was great, and that, all thanks to the berries that were there. Mm -hmm. How about this one? Red yeah, there you go, red-eyed vireo, and catbird. Cat that's that's like that's the elderberry that's right in the middle of the garden. All right. Oh, I just love this. So then we can think about fall fruiting um, plants and shrubs as well, and warblers. Switch. So some of these birds are like switching up their diet. I need to go from high protein insects to things that are going to give me the fat that I need to put on. It's something ridiculous. Like you would have to eat like 52 Big Macs a day to put on the body weight that you need to put on to migrate like a warbler does. Right? So you're just pigging out. That's what these guys are trying to do right now. So that's the buffet you want to put out for them. Um, I have a viburnum in my yard on the corner of my house, right outside my sunroom, and my feeders are there. The catbirds don't like the honeysuckle hedge. They don't like it. They won't nest in there. They barely come in there at all. My next neighbor over has a cedar hedge. Guess what I'm going to replace the honeysuckle hedge with? Cedar, because cedar, that's where all the catbirds are, and then the catbirds are going to come a little bit closer. But right now, the catbirds are coming into my yard to take out all of the berries on the viburnum. The viburnum bush was done in about three days. It was really amazing. It was all right outside the window so that we could watch it. So we have um, fall fruiting um, plants like dogwoods, viburnums, and Virginia creeper, which changes a beautiful red in the fall. Um, they are high fat, good energy for migration. We can consider these things um, the superfoods. They're really the superfoods that we need to put out for them during migration. And this red tone that you see popping up on these plants, that's the cue to the birds that these are ripe. So in a lot of these fruiting, you'll see the stems are a red color. This is Virginia creeper here. This is a, I think this is a gray dogwood um, and a choke cherry down here. That red color is a signal that they are ripe and ready to go. OK, this one, this is tougher. This one? Cape May. This is a Cape May warbler. How about this one? Black pole. Oh my gosh! Right? Find where those dogwoods and viburnums are on the property that you're walking in and follow the weather like Bill told us to do. And then listen for the chip notes and then 
And then you're there. You got it all together. Map it out. And there's our wax wing buddy again. All right, and then finally, winter persistent, right? So these berries that are gonna stick around through the winter time and that are gonna provide food for our resident birds like um, chickadees, there's sumac. Um, oh my gosh, pine grosbeak. I know in St. Albans where all the crab apple trees that the pine grosbeaks feed on. I think this winter I'm gonna do a mapping project of the city and just map where all those trees are and then try to go around and confirm gross beaks. The next time there's a gross beak, right, push, I'm gonna get that down. Um, so I start thinking like the birds, where are they gonna be? And then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna see them all. Um, and then Eastern Bluebird there on the winter berry. So these are really important. They are late berries that stay on the plant. Um, they've got a low lipid content so they don't they don't rot, but they'll freeze thaw, they'll ferment, so then sometimes you get the drunk birds too, which is kind of interesting. Um, but they're really important for winter residents, and then those early birds that arrive back. Think about here in Vermont when it snows in late April, and you're like, oh my gosh, I just saw, or even May, I just saw my first thrush, what are they gonna do? Go to where the sumac is, that's where all the thrushes are gonna be. Right? And the robins are going to be there. All those guys are going to be there. So really super important. Seeds and nectar. Leave your, leave your gardens messy. Allow the jewel weed to grow. I have a couple of neighbors who are like out there boarding. I'm like, no. No. And it's taken me some time. It's a little bit of relationship building. It's a little bit of like soft conversations about, hey, did you notice this about the jewel weed? It's really cool. It's got these um, seed capsules that pop, they explode. It's really fun. Um, that jewel um, weed is also called um, like ladies earlobe or something. Somebody touch told me, me. and touch me not, right? All of those little things. And the hummingbirds like them, and other migrant birds like them. So, and they also warned you that there's poison ivy nearby. Yeah, or stinging nettle, and you mash that up and put that on either of those, and um, that sting of the nettle um, goes away, and it can help with poison ivy too. Luckily, I don't have poison ivy in my yard. I got a lot of jewelry and some stinging nettle, but. Um, mullen, this is the other one that I love yeah. to leave behind. Those beautiful fuzzy leaves, we think of it as a weed, but it's a great seed source um, and a perfect photo opportunity that you know you have in your backyard. What's the mullen on that design? So this is a um, crab apple? apple? Yep. And so in the springtime when those, I pay attention, I pay, you know, we are talking about weather pushing migrant birds. So when that, when the weather's right, foggy morning pushes the birds down, I'm gonna go find where those apple trees are that are just starting to bloom. Great for um, orioles and warblers and all of that. The insects that are in them as well. Um, it's just a great kind of magnet. So the birds. cherry trees, are they? Cherry trees are good too. Mm -hmm. Because I've had whole flocks of like cedar mm -hmm. wax yes. that come and that they have another tree to land in, will land on that and then take turns going down and getting and going back back and forth and back and forth and back yeah. and forth until like it's that. stripped until it's gone then they move on to the next place that's that nomadic nature that they have right so how can we figure out what we need to put and this is this is one of the things that i constantly um i struggle with i fell in love with a plant this year called cup plant anybody know this one yeah it is so beautiful um squarish stems it's literally, it's like seven feet in my garden right now. It's really big. It was given to me by a friend um, down in Grafton. And it has these beautiful leaves that come out, but they wrap around the stem and they form a cup. So water collects in there. They're in the helianthus um, family, I believe. The and yellow, yellow Yeah, flowers. so they, and then the stem comes up and it's like a whole bunch of yellow flowers way at the top. I was so thrilled. I watched tit mice drink out of the water this year. I was like, no way. It actually works. And then um, the hummingbirds have been feeding on it. Now it's native to the Midwest, which I was like, all right, it's a native. I'm going to plant it everywhere. I was planning on collecting the seeds and putting them along the back edge of the yard. And then as I started to do a little bit more research, I discovered that it's actually a little bit problematic in Vermont mm -hmm. because what it does is it starts to spread. It spreads really easily and it outcompetes our regional native plants mm -hmm. like Joe Pieweed and the Goldenrod. Mm -hmm. 
and some of the other wetland edge plants. So be careful. Like the nursery that I went to recently that has it is like, this is native, it's good for your yard. And I'm like, okay, maybe just in the garden where you're gonna contain it, but I'm not gonna plant it along the edge of my property now. So, yeah. There's uh, some cup plant out across the uh, parking lot there. There is. That came out of our original pollinator garden, which yep. is under our feet here. Yep. And it just eats, it just eats space. Yes. Yeah, it takes over everything. Which so I was excited about for the edge of my property, it. but then I was like, no, that's probably not good. All my yeah, we were just not. pulling out cup plant all yeah. summer. So, <laughs> native to the United States is not always native and good for our reasons. So that's my heads up there. I was very sad. Mm -hmm. So I will keep mine contained. Mm -hmm. National Wildlife Federation, and it is Doug Tallamy. Dr. Doug Tallamy is a professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. So he's an expert in the science of plant-insect interactions. And the book that he has read, which I will bring inside so you can see them, and it's on the resource list in the back, is Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. Um, and then uh, another one that's gorgeous to look at that gives you good images of how to landscape on a whole is the living landscape designing for beauty and biodiversity in the home garden. And that one is awesome because I like, I like all the context. And then I zoom in on the individual plants and try to figure out what I need. But he is working on this, and this is in beta form. So when you get there, you're not going to get all the pictures. It's not super robust for Vermont yet, um, but it's really good. So you can go here. You can put your zip code in. You can find butterflies, you can keep your own list, and you can find native plants. And so it'll give you flowers and grasses and trees and shrubs, and it'll give you the caterpillar count for each one of those species, which is really kind of fun. So now I can go through and see where I have what, add that to my map, and see where the holes are where I want to put a little bit more in, especially when it comes to flowers and grasses. I'd like to start taking up less and less lawn. The other one that's really great is the Audubon database, and what they do, it kind of one-ups it. They will give you um, a list. You can, they will send it to you as well, which is great. Um, they'll tell you the attributes, how the birds um, or pollinators can use it, um, and then they give you individual birds that it might attract. And I believe you can do it in the reverse as well. So you can click on the link for the bird and it will give you a list of other species that the bird likes, or yes, that the bird likes as well. And then you can add um, things to your plant list and ask them to email it to you, which is really great. You can find local support as well, I think, once again, which is still very challenging in the state in terms of finding stuff that's truly native. So I encourage you to do a little bit of homework mm -hmm. so you don't fall into the cup plant dilemma like mm -hmm. I did. And where I, where I found the information about the cup plant in New England was here. It's from mm -hmm. the iPain website, so the Invasive Plant Atlas of New England. Mm -hmm. This, I find, has the most robust information. Um, about things that are problematic or truly invasive um, non-natives um, in the state, including, you know, like boa constrictors and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so really, you know, we're, I'm talking to you about native plants, but I want you to think a bit about how this is all really connected and how we can build off of that. One of the things that happened to me this week as I was putting this together is I started to start, think about the slow birding program that I was going to be delivering, and I thought about how this health aspect comes into play here. So one of the things that scientists are discovering is just a walk in a garden or a forest or outdoors does a lot of things for your health, right? It lowers all of the, I think all of those stress hormones and things like that that are like coursing around. So really we can think about how not only are we providing for birds, but we're providing something that's really good for our health and for our public health. I talked a little bit about climate change. This is another one of the pieces. If we really root the landscape in native species, we are gonna be in a much better place as climate starts to shift and change and our, our communities are gonna be a little bit more resilient. And of course, birds are not just only birds, but it's also other wildlife as well. 
And I couldn't help but notice that as I watched how many monarchs and other butterflies were flying around here today. So I'm going to leave you with this quote. There's a um, palm warbler beating, tenderizing caterpillars. How many of you have seen that? Like birds like smacking caterpillars around on a branch before. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, slow burning. You gotta, you gotta sit and watch. Like spend more time with that bird. Some of those behaviors that you're gonna pick up on are amazing. So I'm gonna tenderize it. How many can I carry? Am I gonna feed myself? Is this bird about to feed itself? Or is it gonna move on and grab another one, get a third and a fourth and a fifth, and then take off and feed it? Um, is it going to strip the spines off of it before it eats it? Does it eat it so fast that it's got gobs of caterpillar out the side, and now you're going to watch it bill wipe, which we watched goldfinches do, fly down to the garden to feed, then go up on the branch in the sunshine, the dead trees, and do some bill wiping, and then go back down into the garden to feed oh, yes. no. So it all ties it all ties together. So here's a quote to end things today. This is from, oh my god, we gotta scroll down. How am I gonna do that? No, I don't wanna go there yet. Let's go back. Um, so this is from Oliver Sacks. He is a neurobiologist and he's author of Everything in Its Place, First Loves and Last Tales. I love finding people who are in totally different spheres and circles that have an appreciation for birds and, well, in this case, um, gardening. So he says, clearly, nature calls to something very deep in us. Biophilia, the love of nature and of living things, is an essential part of the human condition. Hortophilia, the desire to interact with, manage, and tend nature, is also deeply instilled in us. The role that nature plays in health and healing becomes even more critical for people working long days in windowless offices, for those living in city neighborhoods without access to green spaces, for children in city schools, or for those in institutional settings such as nursing homes. The effects of nature's qualities on health are not only spiritual and emotional, but physical and neurological. So, with that, I hope you will go back and look at your gardens a little bit differently. Your front yard, your backyard, your side yard, all of that. And think about how you're going to provide that beautiful seasonal buffet for all the birds that maybe you're already seeing or that you saw here today. Thank you guys so much.